Okay, welcome to the 80% of you that are here through choice because you want to learn about the air war in the First World War and to the other 20%, sit yourselves down and take your punishment because this was derived because we had a quiz on New Year's Day and there was a name the pilot round uh, with 12 photos and this is the Detention Aviation Hall of Shame for anyone who scored less than six. That's why Bruce has a smug look on his face because he scored exactly six. And I think that was about the highest score. And frankly, I was ashamed. I cried myself to sleep. So this is your punishment. Um, it's gonna be very swift because the air war is very big. Um, and I'm gonna try and talk for just under an hour and then let you ask questions um, and, maybe pick on some of you who are being punished, uh, but I haven't actually trialed this to see how long it is. So, the air war. Where should we start? Start with my computer being very slow and not wanting to turn the page. There we go. Right, for the benefit of the 20%, this is an aeroplane. This is the finest aeroplane of the First World War. We may come back to her later. That's an SE5A and she's gorgeous, as Peter Hart would say. So let's look at aviation by 1914 and where it stood. It's really new actually, and it's kind of in its infancy, which is why nobody really knows properly how to do, how, how to do aviation when the war starts. It's all very off the cuff and hilarious. And let's just make it up as we go along. So we're gonna ignore balloons in order pr to protect the fragile brains of the 20% in this lecture, um, because balloons go back further and they've been around for a while, but they're not really that interesting and I don't care so much. We're also gonna focus largely on the Western Front because I'm lazy and this is the, what I knew already. Um, there will be mentions of others. So on the 17th of December, 1903, after messing about for a few years, the Wright brothers get a machine off the ground at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. That's only, 11, she had to count, years before the beginning of the First World War. I love, can you see that he's lying face down in that as well? That's them messing around with their aeroplane in North Carolina. So that is when we first get off the ground. By 1905, the Wright brothers have fiddled some more and they can now go about 20 miles and do about 38 miles an hour. So that's how infant air technology is in about 1905. We're now only nine years before the beginning of the First World War. Essentially what they do is first of all manage to bunny hop this thing and the bunny hops just get bigger and bigger until you're actually flying in, in a way that would be recognisable to us. So that's how it all starts off. Uh, people start taking notice of this madness. What's really hilariously funny from my point of view, because I'm English, is laughing at the French. And unfortunately, the Wright brothers weren't screaming very loudly at this point about everything they were doing. Um, and the French were doing similar things and bragging about breaking world records and doing all this amazing stuff when actually they'd been beaten to it. But by 1906, sort of, and, and France is interesting because it's not individuals messing around, it's the state. The French state really wants a stake in this new technology. Um, and it all sort of ties in in about 1908. Wilbur Wright takes Europe by storm um, and goes over and starts bragging about his aerial technology. Um, and France love it, other countries love it as well. And people start really sitting up and paying attention. But it's uh, this is a really simplistic way of doing it. It doesn't happen in isolation. There are other people messing about with aeroplanes, uh, but it's very much a rich man's plaything. I mean, you have things like Lord Northcliffe, Northcliffe boo, we don't like him. Uh, he runs competitions for the Daily Mail, bigger boo, um, for like, if you can fly from, I don't know, I think it's London to Manchester or, or whatever, you can, you can have a 10,000 pound prize. And it's a hobby thing. But very quickly, it becomes something of interest to military all, all over states that are gonna have high stakes in the First World War. So we've got France are uncharacter uncharacteristically excitable and quick off the mark, um, as opposed to just shrugging their shoulders. They form the service aeronautique and buy a right plane in 1909. So they are the first ones off the ground with, uh, in, in essence, like a proper aeroplane thing, because what you also have is uh, countries that had balloon sections that have been messing around with balloons and warfare um, that will just gradually start buying in planes as well. Uh, you have, I'm not even gonna try and say that, but that's the German version and that comes along in 1910. 
the Corpo Aeronautico Militare for Italy is the first to go to war. Now that is, that's one of these balloon section ones. So they start in 1894 and then they start buying planes and everything and it evolves into some kind of air service. Uh, the first time that you actually get airplanes used in combat is like 1911, I think it is. And it's uh, in Libya and it's against the Turks and it's the Italians. So they get the credit for first fighting with airplanes um, and it's reconnaissance miss missions and bombing missions. Royal Flying Corps comes out of a balloon battalion uh, in 1912 as part of the army. Uh, 1912 is a big year because you also get the unpronounceable Russian one, which is just known as the Imperial Russian Air Service in 1912. And I think the Austro-Hungarian aviation troops, that's another one emerging out of an existing unit that had been dealing with balloons. So straight away, people realise two years before the war that this has some relevance to their futures in a military capacity. Please turn the page, there we go. So 1914, we get a war. They're not necessarily independent forces at this point that we're looking at. Um, some of them are sort of hotchpotch groups in other things. Um, you're not looking at any big established things like the RAF, they just don't exist. They're clearly useful, but they're untested by pretty much everyone in terms of how you can, and you know what you can do with them. Like, you know, you can take one up and go and look at what the enemy's doing, but in terms of how to organize them and how to make the information flow and how to interact with other arms and things, people really haven't had enough time to develop any standard operating procedures. Uh, and nobody is thinking about fighter pilots at this point. They're all thinking about using these aeroplanes to do work that benefits the infantry. And that's very much where people's heads are at. And most of the people flying them are basically insane because at the moment they're essentially very large umbrellas made of wood and flammable fabric and uh, other flammable things like obviously the petrol and stuff like that uh, I, and Beth had a heart attack when we were in Belgium and I told her how you landed one of these uh, you switch the engine off that's how you land a plane in World War One you start gliding downwards and then you just turn the engine off and float in uh, which made her cry uh, so it's very very uh, basic technology in terms of flying at this moment I love this guy not only do I love his hat but that is Reginald Chumley um, and he is one of the great pioneers, as far as I'm concerned, of the Royal Flying Corps before the First World War, uh, before the First World War. So he's he's in number three squadron beforehand, um, and he he is one of the ones that will literally give anything a go. We'll talk about night flying a bit later and how insane it is, uh, but he was one of the only people willing to get in one of these basic basic aeroplanes in the dark with a flashlight and give it a go. Uh, sadly, he was killed in 1915. There was a horrible accident at Three Squadron and it was his plane that caught light. I think it was a bomb they were trying to strap to the underside, went off. And there's a whole line of men um, buried together in Chocks Military Cemetery, uh, including Reginald, who was trying to pull people out of the fire. Uh, so sadly, he didn't get to see the evolution of aerial warfare, even though he'd done so much before the war as far as Britain was concerned. Okay, so you'll hear expressions like pushers uh, when we're talking about aeroplanes in this instance. Yes, that constitutes a finished aeroplane. There's not a missing piece. Uh, if you go and see these at RAF Hendon, they do have a hangar. It's not always open because of staffing, uh, but they, they have to tie them down because they literally fall forward on their noses because that's where all the weight is. Um, so they are quite fragile and wimpy. This is a pusher. This is a DH2, I think. Um, and pusher just means the engines behind the person flying the aeroplane and you can see that there because essentially he's just he's just strung out in this little uh, pod in front of it or a nacelle uh, and left to his own devices with the big flammable engine behind him and then obviously you've got I think which is far more standard and people don't generally call these pullers I think because you just assume they are if they're not a pusher uh, this is a BE2C which is the workhorse of the Royal Flying Corps in the First World War. Uh, it's only got a top speed of about 80 miles an hour. It's cumbersome, slow to fly. You don't wanna be facing down a fighter pilot in one of these. And yet that's largely what people did. Most people weren't fighter pilots. Most people were flying aeroplanes like this BE-2C doing jobs that we're gonna come on and talk about. 
So war on the fly, 1914, uh, much like every other aspect of war on the Western Front um, and essentially eventually on the Eastern Front as well, uh, people, it, the war isn't what people expect. They're expecting a moving war. They're expecting what they've always known and that's not what happens. So they have to start adapting. So what do you see with the air war? Um, how big is it as well for a start? So using the RFC as, a, as an example, Five squadrons go over at the beginning of the war. That's four of aeroplanes and one balloon section. That's it. Uh, essentially, as well, 105 officers and 755 men. They just take every serviceable aeroplane they've got, pretty much. At this point, a couple of the squadrons have been fully equipped with the BE-2C, but it's so ad hoc, because don't forget, we're only about two years after the formation of this, that they've basically got a big collection, muddled collection of aeroplanes, and it's just what works. Okay, we'll take that. Uh, James McCudden says it was about 50 aeroplanes that they took over, uh, and I didn't, I didn't go out to verify the exact number, but all that was left at home was a load of duds and training aeroplanes that weren't really good for nothing. Um, they very quickly prove themselves useful in a, in a reconnaissance capacity. It's evident that they can be very useful in this war um, with some development. But what's wrong with it at this stage? Uh, the pitfalls of having your own side shoot at you because everybody on the ground just panics when they see an aeroplane and just starts firing at it. Uh, that's not good. The comedy encounters, how do you deal with each other? Like I said, no one's talking about fighter pilots at this stage. So you've got uh, bona fide accounts of German and British airmen flying past each other and waving uh, in 1914. So you have comedy encounters. Uh, you have comedy encounters with how they try and take each other down as well, because they think, well, surely I should be doing something to this chap. He's on the wrong side. Uh, and it involves taking your revolver out with you and trying to fly your plane straight while shooting, uh, throwing darts, uh, trying to fly over them with uh, metal flechettes, big darts, uh, or grenades and just drop them on them as well. And it's all very inefficient and quite funny at this point. Uh, and adverse conditions on the retreat as well. So I'm probably gonna mention James McCudden quite a few times because I love him, uh, but he started off as a mechanic and he was there from the very beginning and he'd been in since before the First World War. And uh, you don't want these things outside. That picture I showed you, of, uh, which was essentially a load of sticks and some fabric and some flimsy wires. You don't want that open to the element. You can't drag that around and just leave it outside and expect it to be maintained properly and expect it to be in a condition to fly. These things have to be cared for with like kid gloves. They're not resilient. Uh, and there's a brilliant account in his book actually, which is uh, talking about when a storm hit. So they're having to, on the retreat, just stop for the night, tie the planes down. If they can get a tent up over it, great. If not, the poor mechanic just has to sleep under the wing and hope nothing bad happens. And one of his uh, quotes is, at about 1am I was awakened by a lot of shouting to find that a gale had sprung up and just as I opened my eyes I saw Captain Chilton's Blerio, which was par uh, parked or picketed near the parasol, absolutely stand vertical on its tail, poised for a second and then fall over with a resounding crash. Uh, and then another one goes flying, like not in a structured proper flying way, just literally flying across the face of him and ends up squashed as well and he ends up sleeping in the cockpit of a bashed up plane that night so it's not ideal in 1914 and pretty like on the ground they're finding their feet they're just finding their feet so then we move into 1915 and this is when so I want to say something about the knights of the air and the cavalry of the skies and that is that uh, I was talking to Zach about this yesterday it's not just I think it was that uh, that they're seen as chivalric and like uh, heroic knights riding into battle it's a reference to the cavalry of the skies as well what do cavalry do what are cavalry's roles they're things like screening reconnaissance riding out and finding information for you striking behind enemy lines they really do pick up and inherit much of the cavalry's work, uh, historical work, which is part of the reason the cavalry goes down the pan along with all the others, which I'm not going to do a cavalry lecture because it's just dull. Uh, so first of all, they're doing reconnaissance. Your trench map, this is how they're made. Uh, trench maps, reconnaissance, they go out with a map um, of the local area and a pencil on a board. Uh, this is not the pilot, this will be an observer, so he's not expected to do this at the same time, although I'm pretty sure single seater guys would have gone up and tried to do this. Uh, you fly over an enemy point with a pencil and you scribble all over your map and you take it down and you give the information to headquarters on the ground and they try and do something with it. So that's a really important job for the Royal Flying Corps from the beginning. 
Uh, you have things like, I have no idea what's going to come up on this. Ah, oh, contact patrols. So contact patrols, find it. So you've now got a way. Don't forget that World War One is all about problems with communications and the RFC and the R RNAS and the German air services and the Italian and the French, they're constantly looking for ways to help with communications. And one thing you can do is send up a guy to see what's going on the ground and he brings information back to you. Uh, in terms of troop movements, this brilliant photo is a gas attack happening on the Eastern Front. Uh, there's my Eastern Front reference, so Nikolai can't have a go at me. That's probably it for the entire lecture. Uh, so contact patrols are big as well, and artillery observation as well. How do you stay in touch and how do you send this information back? Uh, visual markers. You are like, I tried everywhere to find a picture that I could show you. So you would have a battalion attacking and, for instance, they would all have either stitched onto the, their backs, on their shoulders, uh, a metal disc that would reflect in the sun, or a big star or something like that. And this is very ad hoc, but it was so that pilots could fly over the top and have a look and say, right, well, I've seen all those guys with the yellow stars, which is, I don't know, the, the Royal Highlanders going in that direction. Uh, I can take that information back. The artillery spotting, uh, use codes. So this is a clock code. Um, and essentially what it is, is that you would overlay that over a map. So that your pilot would fly out and say, right, I've seen an enemy battery, which you need to trash with your own guns at 12 F. And you would overlay that over your map, send it home, and then they would range their guns on it. So you're helping the artillery place their guns as well. Because don't forget, what's the first thing that gets trashed on the Western Front? Uh, church towers, because that's what the artillery are climbing to look to see where to fire their guns. So any observation point is being hammered by artillery. But if you can send an airman up there, uh, he can bring the information back. There are some novelty ways to drop this information back. One includes drawing a big clock on a sheet and then having the aeroplane come and drop something on the sheet to show you where it is, which sounds like something from the Krypton Factor, and I'm not sure how accurate it was, but then of course you get wireless as well. This is a wireless set from the First World War taken up by an aircraft, and you can see that there's like a little diagram in there of how it works for people as well, but you could telegraph down the information that you'd come up with. So again, really useful stuff. They're trying, you can see as well that they're trying to do stuff in the midst of battle to maintain communications, which we know is a massive issue in the First World War. Neuve Chapelle is a watershed and that's because of photography. So they had taken some photos during the Battle of the Iron in 1914, but they were blurry and rubbish and not much good to anybody. The downside um, of sending someone up and then coming back with a map that they've scribbled all over is it's not very coherent. They're trying to, they're flying at the time. The conditions aren't great. They might actually be trying to fly the plane at the time as well. Uh, and you get this mess of a map handed down and it's supposed to tell you really important stuff like about where you should fire your guns and which, where there's a strong point that is gonna hold your infantry up if you try and attack it. If you can take decent photos like the one here and you can sit them down with a headquarters, with intelligence things and pour over them at your leisure to gain information, it's much, much better for everybody. Uh, it's huge value. Um, and you can keep going back to it. And you can also as well, you can photograph uh, periodically to see what's changed too. Uh, so you've gone from interpretation using a map and flying around of what is going on right now while people retreat. This is a different kind of information gathering. This is telling you about the digging of defensives. It's telling you about troop movements. Uh, it's telling you about equipment arriving. Uh, and as I say, you get it at your leisure. And Neuve Chapelle is a watershed because for the first time they create essentially a massive map out of them. They take, I think it's about 1500 and they make a giant map. And then they overlay that to make the kind of trench maps that you're used to. That's why you can't find a trench map from before this period. This is why they start when they do, because they've harnessed this. They've spent the winter getting their act together and thinking about how they can do something actually really, really useful for the troops on the ground. And Neuve Chapelle is the watershed for this as far as the British are concerned. Let's move away from the chronology for a bit and talk about um, what it's like being in an aeroplane. Uh, scary is the answer. You've got danger from below. Uh, you're gonna see whenever I show you um, a range, like you saw a range of cameras on the last slide. 
there's no uniformity. And look at these anti-aircraft guns. I mean, you've got one earlier French one, which is just sort of an ad hoc gun. And then you've got a proper reconditioned artillery thing that's been like diverted for use as an anti-aircraft gun. Everything's ad hoc in the air war while they get it together. Uh, but you've got people on the ground that don't want you either flying over them with bombs strapped to you, or they, they, they know that you're taking back information about them to the enemy, they will try and shoot you down. So you're in danger from people on the ground. Don't mess with the Queen Mother either. This, I just have to throw this in because it makes me laugh so much. So that is the anti-aircraft detachment at Sandringham during the war. And uh, the Royals were just as bad as everybody else when it came to, obviously the advice, when there was an air raid is run away and hide. Um, and the first thing everybody does at Buckingham Palace when there's an air raid is run to the window to see what's happening. Queen Alexandra spent a lot of time at Sandringham um, and was the worst for this. And she actually wrote a letter uh, to one to the authorities. I think it was to Churchill because at first the Royal Navy had the responsibility for air defense. And she asked for rockets. Um, if you can picture the Queen Mother on a balcony at Sandringham, uh, with a rocket launcher shooting down Germans because she wanted to do it herself. She actually wanted to have a pot shot at some of the dirty Hun. Uh, to be fair to her, they had invaded her country in 1864 and she never let go of that. You also be an absolute danger to yourself flying as well. Night flying, I mentioned it before um, with Reginald Chumley and how much of a loon he had to be to try it, but it's almost inconceivable in 1914 the problem with night flying in the First World War is you've got no horizon, you've got nothing to light up the cockpit, you can't see your instruments, uh, and so much of it is about flying on balance as well. If you listen to pilots talking about when they're most scared, it'll be flying into a cloud because they don't know if they're the right way up, they don't know what height they're going to come out as, and they, they haven't got any bearings, and it's terrifying, and that's what flying at night is like at the beginning of the war. Um, it's, it's fundamental um, runs up against everything because you, you've got no idea where you are, you've got no idea of how to get yourself down safely. They do uh, develop like flare paths for landing aeroplanes, uh, but in the beginning, you've got, like I said, you switch the engine off and you glide in. And how do you know what height you're at when it's pitch black? Uh, it really was terrifying and there were some really tragic results as well. I will never forget, there's a guy called Eustace Raleigh who was, I think he was 20 in 1918, um, and he did quite a lot of night flying and he and his observer were in a crash um, and he broke his back and he died a whole year later at the RAF hospital uh, because he had lay there for, with a broken back ailing for over a year and that was a night flight crash. Uh, so it really was dangerous stuff. Um, so in 1915 then, it's already not very safe to be flying an aeroplane um, for reasons demonstrated, especially at the front. And now you've got people chasing you as well because the birth of the fighter pilot makes perfect sense when you're thinking about it. So this is a crashed aeroplane that's been brought down by somebody. Uh, you can't have this. You can't have all of your working machines being shot down and trashed by the enemy. Um, you need to defend them. So what do you do? You send a nippy little pilot up there in a better plane um, and he'll escort your guy or he'll, he can either escort personally or he'll patrol an area uh, to make sure that no other nippy little guy comes along and tries to shoot your man down. So that's how the concept of fighter pilots is born. Um, it's, it just evolves out of the, the ordinary work that people do uh, in the air. So what do you do first of all? Well, you arm the aeroplanes. This is really important in 1915, 16. Uh, yes, that is me sitting in an SE5 having the best day ever. Um, that there close up of something technical that I don't understand is an interrupter gear. Um, so what they did, the problem obviously with mounting a gun on the side of the aeroplane uh, is that, can you imagine trying to aim a gun in one direction? whilst trying to fly in another. So ideally, what you want to be able to do is point your aircraft in the direction you want to fire and let loose at the enemy. Um, unfortunately, you shoot your own uh, propeller off if you tried to do that until this thing comes along. These interrupter gears basically were finite timed so that they fired in between the propellers when they were running at full speed uh, so that you could fire straight forward in the direction you were flying without killing yourself. So it was genius. Um, and this is what really 
turns the air war for the Germans in 1915. Uh, you can see that's the later, the thing I'm playing with is from later in the war. That's like on a on a thing above that. that so you've got one gun in front of um, my fist, there, my right hand there, and that's the Vickers. And then you've got a Lewis gun above as well, which is on the plane, so it's double arms. So that's where we get to after. But that one on the left is sort of an early uh, example of an interrupter gear. So that makes all the difference and it results in what is known as the Fokker Scourge, which sounds absolutely terrifying. Uh, it's been overdone a bit because people at the time were so utterly terrified of them. Uh, they thought it was witchcraft on the Allied side in 1915 um, because the Germans were so good and they cite, so on your right, there is Immelman, and he's really famous at this point. He's like credited often as the first guy to shoot someone down using one of these guns that's using an interrupter gear. Um, and in 1950, the latter half of 1915, he's quite exceptional. Uh, he's a really skillful pilot as well. He's got some maneuvers named after him. Um, but they couldn't understand how they were so, and it was in line with better aircraft as well. They just had a better plane. They had the Fokker Eindecker to do this with, um, but they just could not gather how the Germans could shoot so many down, how they were doing it and what was going on. And people were utterly terrified of it, which is why it was called the Fokker Scourge. Uh, German air superiority though absolutely does exist at this point and it cripples the Allies. So it begins in the summer of 1915. I think it's about July that the first ones with interrupter gears get out there. Um, that's, the that's the morale implications as well as the actual physical implications. But in about six months, the RFC loses 120 planes to this, which is awful. Um, they flew restricted. So on the 14th of January, 1916, uh, an edict went out and they were told that until better aircraft um, came, no long range or short range reconnaissance uh, was up allowed up without a minimum of two aeroplanes escorting it. Um, possibly three. So they were trying to protect them in groups, uh, reduce the amount of work that the RFC could do. Uh, the Fokker Scourge kind of waned during Verdun um, in, in about March 1916. Uh, so we get we get hold of one of the Iron Deckers. Uh, it lands accidentally at a British airfield. Um, and when they pick it apart, they realise it's not magic. And there is actually no amazing um, aircraft thing making it 10 times better than a British aircraft. Uh, we're also the allies are developing or the French are developing a better aircraft to fight against it and fly. Because at the moment, the ad hoc thing I told you about, these fighter pilots are flying any old aircraft as best they can. And there are certain aircraft that are much better and more suitable for it. But now they're starting to build fighter scout aircraft, which are specifically for this purpose. And we've got one of those coming as well. Um, but Immelman was just regarded as invincible and actually so he dies in June 1916 and the Germans wouldn't have it that he'd been shot down by an enemy because it was impossible so there was all these different um, descriptions someone said that the interrupter gear failed and he shot his own propeller off or it was friendly fire but they were just utterly unwilling to admit that someone could have taken this I say kid he was 25 this kid down uh, so he was very famous which brings us in 1915 to the emergence of the aces. Uh, so this, is, this doesn't exist as a concept before this period. So what is a fighter ace and what, what do they have to do to get that title? Uh, so it varies a little bit, but it's generally accepted that they have to have shot down a minimum of five victories. So victory is scored when it's shot down or forced out of the sky. You don't necessarily have to send um, your opponent down in a ball of flame. Uh, you could just force them to land. That can be classed as a victory as well. Uh, and for it to count, you should really have reliable witnesses as well. Um, I'm not gonna comment on some of the scores out there with some of the pilots and what I think of some of their witnesses, but uh, things like the Red Baron, you would think with 80 that some of those would be ropey, but they're actually surprisingly good. Uh, James McCudden, who's my favorite, uh, my unashamed favorite. Uh, again, he's a very good, but you get some where it's like, mm, I'm really sure that should have counted uh, and it can be a bit dodgy. So by now, if you've got groups of pilots and they're all sort of fighter pilot indoctrinated and that's what they're up there to do, then you'd expect some sort of tactical doctrine to be emerging uh, for people. This is the British doctrine in 1915 from one of our best pilots at the time, which I love, literally two words. Uh, this is gone. It's funny, but this is gone. By 1916, 
you're looking at far more involved. People are starting to actually look at what makes a successful pilot um, and how he can keep himself safe as well, which is important because I, that, that guy, Lana Hawker, that I just passed by quite quickly, uh, did not fly safe. There are some of them, there's like two breeds of pilot, uh, the absolute lunatics with no regard for their personal safety. And then you've got the calculated ones who think more about what they're doing. Um, James McCudden is one of the latter and as is uh, the guy that came up with this. So Dick Tobolka is still kind of regarded as a brilliant guide of how not to get dead flying an aeroplane in war. So Oswald Bolker was a, a pre-war German officer uh, who loved dancing, but not newfangled dancing, like stuff that would emerge in the 20s and get fashionable. He liked old fashioned dancing. and He was quite good at it, apparently. Uh, he's very sweet. I like him. Uh, but he gave out this list of who, uh, of how to fly and not get yourself killed. And, and he's the Red Baron's idol. I think the account when the Red Baron meets him on a train, I think, uh, and he's just absolutely starstruck. Uh, the first part of the war, this is the dude you go to. So Immelman's one of the first kind, he's a bit of a loom. This is one of the second kind, uh, along with the likes of McCudden that think more. So his dicta says, try to secure advantages before attacking. If possible, keep the sun behind you because then obviously they can't see you if the sun's behind you, um, if, and it means think about where you're attacking from. Don't just go barreling in there. You need to try and make sure that you're in an advantageous position before you fling yourself into aerial combat. Always carry through an attack when you started it. So he's basically saying, be decisive. Uh, don't faff around because there's no room for it. Because if you're not, then they will be and you'll pay. Fire only at close range and only when your opponent is properly in your sights. Don't go spraying your bullets around uh, and wasting them. Because once you're up there, you're up there with what you've got with you. And once it's gone, it's gone. And you don't want to be left without any ammunition in a fight. So what he's saying is keep your powder dry until you know it's going to be effectively used. Always keep your opponent on your eye on your opponent and never let yourself be deceived by ruses. Concentrate, basically. Uh, the ruses thing is like it's an add-on but, but watch what you're doing because if you lapse your concentration you're done for so he's saying concentrate in any form of attack it's essential to assail your enemy from behind for obvious reasons because no one's firing backwards from these things as we've established now these interrupter gears everybody's guns point forward um you want to be able to fire on your opponent and if he's coming at you from behind then you're in the disadvantageous position if your opponent dives on you, we'll get to tactics a bit later. Uh, do not try and evade his onslaught, but fly to meet it. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I agree with that one. I think, he, I think he's saying again, be decisive. But when I tell you that, that these calculating guys who thought more about how they flew in that, they're not killed by the enemy in the end, but Volker was uh, killed in a mid-air collision. So I'm not sure how I feel about that edict on his uh, list. But when over the enemy's lines, never forget your own line of retreat. Again, focus. Make sure you know the way home. It's actually surprisingly difficult once you're up there because they would sometimes be several miles behind the line. So they can't just look down and go, oh, that's a trench. That's my side. That's their side. You need to concentrate because you need to know how you're getting out of there. And then he's, this is far reaching for 1916, already looking at formation flying in that when he says, for the squadron, attack on principle in groups of four or six. When the fight breaks up into a series of single combat, take care that several do not go for the same opponent. Again, so concentrate because it ends up being a mid-air melee and you don't want to end up colliding with someone. And you don't, if, you, if you've all got an opponent picked out and you all concentrate and then everything should take care of themselves. If you're all chasing one, then what are the other five doing? Uh, so it's all really common sense stuff, but until he sat and wrote it down, really, in the air war, it's not, it's not taken for granted. In 1916, then I was saying that we were waiting on a better plane. They started arriving. This is the Newport 12. Uh, this turns up as well. Uh, we end up in March 1916. We get the Bristol Scouts arrived as well, which is the first British ones that come over with those interrupter gears. So we're more on a level, uh, which means that things balance back out. I think the aerial supremacy in the First World War is really like a pendulum that keeps swinging backwards and forwards. And it's coming far, far back towards the middle and even on the Allied side for the rest of 1916, as opposed to being wholly one sided for the Germans. 
you end up with this breed of pilot that I was telling you about though. Um, you end up with these kids flying. Uh, this is not Cesc Fabregas, it's uh, Georges Guinemer and Albert Ball. If we ever do another photo identification round, this actually was on it. Um, they're very young, they're very immature. They don't fly like Volker, they don't fly like McCudden. They go flinging themselves in to danger um, without really thinking about how they're gonna get back out of it. Um, they're very successful when it goes right, but really for all of them, it was only a matter of time until it stopped going right. Um, you, they will go out with their squadrons, in, but they'll also, I mean, they, so Paul had a second aircraft and they would get to come home and on their own, on their own dime, like on their own initiative, go back out in another aeroplane. Um, you would get Guinemir, go out, fly, run out of petrol, come back, fill up, go out again, come back. And, and no one's really policing them. Um, so they are good when it goes well, but really it was only ever going to end one way for all of this kind of pilot if they stayed there long enough. Um, but towards the end of 1916 and into the beginning of 1917, they do do really well and they become famous. Um, even Albert Ball, we'll get into a bit of celebrity culture later, uh, but for a British pilot to be famous is a big deal as well, because uh, we don't do that. We do that stiff upper lip British thing where we don't want to favour one person over another. Um, but in 1917, are we going there or are we going to go? Yeah, in 1917, we get Bloody April, Aces High and all the depressing stuff. So these guys are doing really well. Um, by this point, the RFC, I think, has five brigades um, in two wings, uh, five aircraft parks. It's huge compared to what it started off as. Um, the upturn in fortunes didn't last very long. So at the beginning of 1917, that pendulum's going back again towards the Germans. Um, they've gone heavy into formation flying and really aggressive, uh, and it's working really well. Um, and unfortunately, because the Arras offensive is taking place and we want to know everything that's going on at the ground and we need to try and claim, because if you don't have superiority in the air, by this point, you can't really expect to have it on the ground. So the allies are forced to go up anyway. And that's how bloody April happens because it's not in an advantaged uh, position and yet they're still going up, um, trying to sweep the enemy out of the sky and they're getting absolutely battered. Um, this is when you see those stats about a pilot's life expectancy being six weeks and things like that. This is probably the worst part of the war for the allies, definitely for the RFC. Come on. There we go, uh, which leads, and then as you go further on into 1917, uh, our SE5, my favorite plane, turns up in April with 56 squadron, uh, who've been sort of assembled out of some of the most promising recruits and people like Albert Ball and McCudden. So it, it's really sort of designed to be a crack squadron and sort of they turn up and then we've got the numbers to do the formation flying too. And you end up in the sort of August and September of 1917. Um, and so they go up early in the morning and they go up in the evening. That's generally, you'll do like a patrol before breakfast and then you'll do um, one in the early evening and you get these accounts of early evening in that August, September time where the sky is just full of aeroplanes fighting each other. Uh, so you get uh, mass dogfights for the first time ever, uh, and you get formations flying against formations, and then sort of the odd guy getting drawn in or throwing himself into if he's one of these lone wolf types that go off. Um, and this is one of, one of the best pilots of this sort of era of the war is there, that's a uh, boss who is, he's not at Langemark, but he's commemorated at Langemark. Uh, a German pilot, again, 20 years old, um, amassed a stack of victories flying this silvery blue triplane before he was killed uh, September 23rd, 1917 by 56 Squadron. Um, we'll meet the person who supposedly took him down in a bit. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know how this is gonna work out, right? How to win a dogfight, a practical demonstration not to scale so we've already talked about how you want to be above and behind the person that you want to attack, which evidently means if you see a guy there, you go higher. If they see you, they go higher, which means that you start off quite high up um, and then the diving starts. So you start diving on each other, you start circling around each other. And the, the principle is during these these one on one fights, you will get lower and lower and lower until one of you wusses out and pulls up or something goes wrong. One of you will 
will um, lose his nerve and land and that's a victory for the other guy um, or something bad will happen or your gun will jam or you'll pull out um, and give in. But that's essentially what will normally happen in one of these combats is that they will chase each other down until they can get no lower. Uh, that's what Albert Ball is doing when he's killed in uh, May 1917. Uh, he comes out of a cloud upside down, but he's fighting uh, the Red Baron's brother. Uh, and that's what happens. He runs out of room and he comes out upside down and I don't think he has time to write himself and he ends up crashing. Uh, so that's what does for you. And that's roughly in a very brief, uh, not to scale version, how those fights play out normally. Um, Let's talk about away from the front for a bit um, and using aeroplanes to attack people on the ground. So this is something that hadn't even been invented in 1903 until the end of 1903. They can now bring bombs and come flying over your city and rain down death on you. So I think, with, I know the German sh uh, shell Hartlepool in, that, in 1914, that's the first time that British people have been sh like attacked on British soil since the 1660s. So this doesn't happen. You've had this glorious isolation from the Royal Navy for hundreds of years. And now suddenly these flimsy looking airplanes can bring bombs over and drop them on you. And it's, it's acknowledged that this is gonna be a threat from the very beginning of the war. Um, so these are Paris. That's actually a later picture, but I love it. So it, it's purported to be um, a nighttime raid on Paris in 1918. Uh, is what that photo is there. But you can see from earlier in the war there, a lot of Parisians crowded around a big hole in the pavement that's decimated the subway underneath the metro. Um, so people in major cities like that, they expected it from the very beginning. You've got these hilarious stories in London of people taking all of their favorite furniture down to the basement uh, and making their basement into like a little boudoir they can hang out in at night. And um, our vision of all this is, is obviously colored by the second blitz, the World War II blitz which is far more intense and far more fiery in that. But this is no less real to the people that lived it and no less scary uh, based on everything I've said. So first of all, it comes from Zeppelins. The Germans invested massively in these before the First World War. They loved them um, and they used them or they tried to use them. At first, the Kaiser said that nobody was allowed to come uh, east, uh, uh, west of the, the East End and the docks in London because uh, it wasn't sporting and that but that goes out the window really quick and he doesn't do anything to rein it back um so we do end up with zeppelins flying all over the place uh, I think they're quite comical at the beginning so one zeppelin I think its kill rate was uh it went out on a mission it came back having killed one cow in a field uh we mentioned night flying and it being dark and really not being able to figure out what you're trying to do I mean yes they're lit up inside their zeppelins but uh, you've got, and there's definitely, there's one uh, report where they're going on about how they've reached London and they're gonna bomb London and it's lower stocked. I mean, how you can confuse the two, I have no idea. Uh, so it's, uh, although people panicked at the beginning of the war, hid all their valuables in the basement, the Bodleian Library in Oxford puts all of the valuables in the basement as well. The students help get rid of them. Uh, it's, not, it's not menacing straight away. The life on board as well, which most people don't really tend to consider. Uh, I'm going to read something that if you've done a war walk with me, you would have heard before, but that's an artist's impression of what goes on inside a Zeppelin. Um, and we actually have an account from uh, a guy called Eric Linares, who flew with LZ-37 over London in the spring of 1915, uh, and what it felt like to be doing his first raid on London. So he says, uh, the air was keen and we buttoned up our jackets as if we prepared to deal the first blow against the heart of your great and powerful nation. Inside the gondola, it was pitch dark save for the glowing pointers of the dials. The sliding shutters of the electric lamps with each one of the crew was provided, was drawn. There was tension as I leaned out of one of the gondola portholes and surveyed the lace work of lighted streets and squares. An icy wind lashed my face. I mounted the bombing platform. My finger hovered on the button that electrically operated the bombing apparatus. Then I pressed it. We waited. Minutes seemed to pass before, above the humming song of the engines, there rose a shattering roar. 
I pressed again. A cascade of orange sparks shot upwards and a, bl a billow of incandescent smoke drifted slowly away to reveal a red gash of raging fire on the face of the wounded city. Uh, he's exaggerating a, a little bit, I feel. Uh, but nonetheless, it's really interesting to see what it felt like up there in the air. Um, and probably the most chilling World War One picture. I think we see so much of it. And I think um, we maybe get a little bit um, used to the violence that we see in photos but this creeps me out every time. This is the indentation of someone who fell from a Zeppelin and landed on the ground, uh, which I think is rather moving and terrifying in equal measure. Obviously we wanted to shoot them down, that goes without saying. Uh, I do have as well, really interesting, just a little piece from a kid who was working at one of London's theatres later in 1915, when a Zeppelin came, came to town. Actually, he was, over, he, was, he was having a cigarette outside another theatre with a friend. And he said that uh, they say the Zeps are on the way, the swine, I remarked. As though my words had released 10,000 furies, there was a sudden crackle of anti-aircraft gunfire and simultaneously a dreadful sound that London only knew too well, a sound like no other on earth. It was the mournful wail created by the velocity of a descending bomb. In one brief, terrible moment before the impact, I instinctively knew it was coming directly where we stood. I was not wrong. It exploded three yards from where we were standing. It flung me against the the wall near the pit entrance to the Strand Theatre. It sucked me back in, it dashed me to the ground, masonry fell, glass rained, I felt unhurt, only dazed, yet I had 22 lumps of shrapnel embedded in me. They carried me downstairs into the bar of the Strand Theatre. The streets were pandemonium. I asked for Billy, but he had been blown to pieces. I could hear screams in the street outside, the dull, vibrant thud of more bombs. So although it's not the Blitz as we know it, it's certainly something that uh, they were never gonna forget being a part of. And then you have the advent of the bomber. Um, that's a gotha, the dreaded gotha on the left, and that's an RAF equivalent as well. So once again, with the ad hoc nature of the air war, they've kind of been utilizing whatever aircraft they've got and strapping bombs to that and giving it a go, but then you get them building these huge bombers whose intention is to go out and bomb people. So they're bigger, they carry more crew, and they carry more bombs as well. Taking precautions, uh, this is a family in the East End have built their own shelter. We have searchlights, just like we do in World War II. Uh, and that's a, a primary school doing a drill. Um, she's pretending to be wounded and they're doing an evacuation drill for what happens if a bomb uh, lands on you. <coughs> Primitive warning systems. There's no big whale like in World War II. Uh, there's a policeman driving around with a car that says, take cover, or a policeman on a bike. Uh, blowing a whistle or a boy scout with a bugle, uh, basically quite low key ways, someone running around waving their hands and telling you to get out of the way. Um, that's how it works in the First World War. 13th of June 1917 is uh, a key day because it's the worst raid uh, of the First World War on Britain. Uh, so it's on London, it's, oh, I say 13 Gothers, but it's a formation of Gothers that come over in the middle of the day. So Liverpool Street Station gets smacked um huge and so does the building on the right so that is a primary school in east london in poplar and what happened was the bomb came through the boys classroom through the girls classroom and into the nursery classroom below and it killed 19 children that's the school caretaker um clearing the debris and as as folklore has it in that he actually had to he found his own son in the wreckage. His son was killed, but it's allegedly it, it's him that actually finds his boy, uh, who was five, I think. So there's a memorial in East London to 19 school children who died on that day. So this was catastrophic, this raid, um, and really amped up the idea of public shelters and things like that you're used to seeing in the Second World War. So you would get like, I know the King did visits uh, to a factory who had converted their whole basement so hundreds of people could get down there if they needed to, uh, but there was no bigger raid from that. But you do get about 1500 British civilians during World War I killed as a result of air action. Uh, so it's not a small deal. Don't forget the naval contribution either, otherwise they cry. Uh, this is the first aircraft carrier, as HMS Furious, that we had. Uh, unsurprisingly, you usually find naval air contingents near water. First thing they did was cover the BEF deployment in 1914. 
Uh, Navy, as I said, the Navy had responsibility until 1916 for the air defense of London. Um, I don't know if it was the whole of Britain uh, until the army took it over. Uh, submarine patrols you can do because you can see them from the air. There's some great pictures of that. Uh, so although the army have got theirs, the, the Navy too have got their own air service, which is key. Uh, and by 1918, it's all got rather large and unwieldy. So numbers at the time, uh, 20,000 aircraft and 300,000 personnel when the RAF was formed in April 1918 by merging the Royal Naval Air Service with the much bigger Royal Flying, Flying Corps, which made it the biggest air force in the world. Um, you got a recruitment poster there for the Americans as well. So by this point, everybody has acknowledged and developed and realized that there's a huge, huge role for aircraft to play in war. And actually, I'd say that you cannot win a battle on the ground without fighting in the air as well. It's just not an option not to show up in the air. It's part of modern battle. Um, and as Peter Hart's always banging on about, um, all arms battle is how we win the war the Allies in 1918 by combining everything we'd learned in regard tanks, artillery, uh, new technology and bringing it cohesively together to form an attacking force is how the hundred days happen uh, and that's that includes the air war that is um, an image that's supposed to show you so one thing that really strikes me as possibly like the key thing to come out of 1918 in terms of liaising with troops on the ground is that they begin shooting on troops on the ground like en masse, they start ground strafing as well. And some of the pilots are really badly affected by it and they hate the idea and they don't want to do it. Uh, but uh, you know, you've, you've heard stories about it in World War II and it's just common sense really as well. If you're in the air and you've got a machine gun and you see your, your side on the floor not doing very well, then you're going to try and pound them with your machine gun. Um, and that really comes about as part in, in tandem with the all arms battle thing. So the air has a massive, massive role to play um, towards the end of the war as well. Um, well, I've only talked about the Western Front, but there's flying on all different kinds of fronts. Uh, two things that always stick in my mind are on the left there. So that, they're two boys at Eton. And what he's showing there is it was it was considered fashionable at the time to find a picture of an attractive woman and you would wear her inside your top hat. And that's what that kid is doing. His name's John Caldwell. Uh, both of those boys actually ended up um, serving in the RAF. Uh, and you've got Ian who survived on the left and on the right you've got John who didn't. Uh, he was flying in Mesopotamia and he was shot down uh, and his issue there with being shot down is the wide open spaces. You're not looking at the western front where you just have to feel like, right, realise which side of the line you've come down on. His problem is that he's like 40 miles away from anything um, and he actually manages to get to within 15 miles of home before uh, they think. So they found, his, found him murdered which they think was local Arabs. Um, and stripped and that so he, he had been caught they caught up with him I think it, sorry it was 10 10 miles out he'd actually run out of luck uh, before he could get home and on the right you can see uh, an airplane in Mesopotamia as well the big issue there that I remember there's a great account by someone who flew out um, in what is now Iraq in World War One is the heat so you've got a heat of 120 degrees uh, it was warping the planes so <laughs> you know, literally if you left your plane out in the sun you would come back and it would be a different shape which was problematic uh, and caused many accidents and things when people tried to fly them. So there are different challenges for different places in the First World War. Okay, for the 20% in the room, pilots are the people that fly the aeroplanes. Um, you can broadly break them down as far as the RFC, RAF is concerned into two kinds of categories. On the right is James McCuggan, who I've not shut up about for the whole lecture because I love him in case I didn't mention it. Uh, he is the one that started off as uh, an air mechanic. So or he started off as, uh, he worked on the engine of one of the planes. He was massively into uh, motorcycles as well. He was from an army family. His dad had been in the army. His brother was killed in 1915 uh, flying. His other brother was killed in 1917 flying. Uh, James went from airman second class to major VC in the course of the First World War. Uh, I love him in case I didn't mention it. Uh, so he's one type of pilot that sort of 
you do get promotion from in the ranks. It is quite rare. It's definitely rare to be as successful and as well known as he was, but it does happen. But on your left, you have the person that got me into the whole First World War in the first place, uh, which is Arthur Reese Davids. Uh, I spent about five years just obsessing about him before I realised there was actually a war going on around him back in the early 2000s. He's the one that was credited, as I said, with sh uh, shooting down Werner Voss in 1917. He's another 56 squadron. And he's really the archetypal recruit they were looking for in terms of pilots if they had a choice so he was head boy at Eton uh, he was um, bright going to Oxford deferred to go and fight in the war had interest in he was good at sport that was another thing they wanted they wanted to know that you were proficient at sort of physical exercise and team games and things like that one thing he wasn't that they did look for um, was uh, into mechanical stuff so if they were obsessed with wireless telegraphy or motorbikes or things like that then that went in their favor as well uh, but you sort of again there's a divide with pilots you've got people like McCudden who know how every butt nut and bolt should work on their plane and how every engine cylinder works and they want to oversee the whole thing themselves before they go up in it to know that they're going to be safe and then you have people like Reese Davis who don't give a damn they just come like he famously lands on one day and, and he flew like a maniac he's in the same gang as like Albert Paul and uh, he landed one day and <clears throat> the wings were hanging off of his SC5 and his little airman goes to him because you would have someone allocated to your plane for, for like doing the, the plane and doing the rigging and doing the engine and his, the guy that looks after his plane says to him you really got to stop doing that because you're going to die and he goes well no it's just your job to fix it isn't it and flounces off uh, so you have to they had to put like brackets underneath the wings on his plane. So again, ad hoc, learning on the fly, they, they come up with a way to solve it. Now, he was actually very sweet. That makes him sound like a dick. He was, he was lovely. Um, but that is what they're looking for. Public school boys, uh, good at sport, into mechanical things, bright, young. Um, the best pilots um, like Ball and Reese Davids and Guinemere have no sense of their own mortality. Uh, there are some very good pilots they do, but it messes with their head completely. So, so these guys suffer. Guinea should not have been in the air on the day he died. He was doing the whole lone wolf thing with no policing. And had there been a structure in place that would have prevented him from flying, he would not have been in the air because he was a wreck. Uh, Reese David, so they, they generally used to make you fly for six months, the RFC, and then they would send you home establishment for a while to train new pilots and give you a break because they realised they just couldn't leave you out there indefinitely. Reese Davis was overdue. Uh, I think McCudden was on leave and they, he was waiting for him to come back or, or there was something wrong with the leave cycle and he was just there a few days too long um, and he was killed after six months. Um, I can't remember what I was saying now. So yeah, you get the you get these pilots like that who should not be in the air. Um, but then you get pilots like one that always strikes me is Mick Mannix. So he's thirty odd. Uh, so which makes him ancient by first world war pilot standards but i mean he is absolutely wrecked in the head and it's because he knows the stakes and the consequences he's paying for he's got a level of maturity much like mccudden and bulker that knows that actually if you get shot down that's it that's game over there's no second chance uh, so it's really interesting the psychological stuff that happens to pilots is, is really interesting we'll compare them uh, actually to the PBI, as they used to call them, the poor bloody infantry. So you've got all these guys on the floor going, I wouldn't be one of those idiots up there, that sucks. And you've got all the pilots looking down and going, yeah, you wouldn't get me in a trench, no way. In fact, lots of them had been in trenches and liked it because they couldn't stand it. Another guy in 56 Squadron who's friends with uh, James McCudden and killed in an accident in July 18 is David Henderson's son. He was one of the early leaders of the RFC, Ian. Uh, who was in the Argyll and Southern Highlanders in 1915 in the trenches and his letters are just like, I cannot sit here anymore, it sucks, I need to do something different, and he joins the RFC. Um, so interestingly, they don't generally seem to want what the other one has, but what are the differences? Um, Pilots get to go home to put a nice warm bed at night. These are, I think this is a list of brags by Lord Flashheart at some point, isn't it? Um, you also have better quality of life. You've got a lovely mess, there's booze around, where you live isn't right on the front lines. Uh, they have days out, they have the 56 Squadron has a band that goes around playing music for everybody. And that's, so that's not just the officers, that's everyone. So arguably it's a better existence at the front. The girls love you as well. Everyone loves a pilot. Those maternity jackets that they wear in the RFC, they're like a magnet for girls, um, but bad side. They have a far higher chance of dying every time you go and do your job. So if you're on the ground in a trench, you can sit there for days on end and nothing happens. Like boredom is your only friend. 
uh, if you're going up to fly two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening, and you can guarantee on both those occasions that a whole load of German planes are going to try and find you and kill you, not to mention all the Germans on the ground trying to kill you as well, uh, what does that lead to? Higher stress environment. Um, they cracked arguably a lot quicker than the guys in the infantry uh, and on the ground for that reason. Um, because there's no escape as well. There's no way out. Once you're up there, you're done. There's no parachute. Um, and the biggest, I think the biggest fear for pilots was being shot down in flames. This is Manic's obsession that he didn't want to burn um, up there because there's no way out other than jumping out of the aeroplane, which obviously doesn't end well either. And a sort of like, so the urban legend is like he took a revolver up with him uh, and that he had always said he would shoot himself in the head if his plane burned rather than burn on the way down. Um, and he actually does burn. Um, but seeing as I'm just going to say we don't know where he's buried because I'm not opening that can of worms, uh, we don't actually know whether he did. I hope he did. I hope he got to put himself out of his misery if that's the case, because that was his utter worst fear was a, a burning plane and no way out. So there's checks and balances. Um, we did this with the kids when we did one of the um, youth ones during lockdown and actually so all of the kids that said they wanted to be pilots when we started once we kind of told them the horror stories uh not in obviously not in the way i've just told you it was very appropriate for eight-year-olds uh but none of them wanted to be pilots afterwards uh brilliantly sarah's little boy uh, isaac was just like i don't know i would be on the ground now i'm not doing that that sucks uh so i don't know have a think i might ask some of you afterwards being in an airplane isn't comfortable at this time either There's a total lack of space. There's famously Cecil Lewis is six foot four and has to fly with his knees under his chin. You've seen me sitting in an SE5. I'm not, I'm, I'm short and I was cramped. It's not comfortable. Um, and you're stuck there for quite some time, two and a half, three hours. It's freezing cold and it's exposed. So there's no uh, cockpit over your head or anything. You're out, you're out in the open. Um, and you could be going up to, we'll talk about heights in a second, but you're going up thousands of feet as well. The higher you go, the colder it gets. Um, <clears throat> this is a brilliantly rubbish German attempt to do an enclosed cockpit. I don't know what that plane is uh, or what happened to it, but he unsurprisingly did not catch on. Um, so they mummified themselves, basically. Uh, they would go up, there's all kinds of hilarious outfits. Like this is a pretty standard. I'm gonna wear like leather gloves and a coat, but you've got them wearing like badger skin mufflers and all kinds of nonsense. Again, totally ad hoc. Anything you can skin and make warm, you would do it. And, and they're literally mummifying themselves to stay warm. Regarding the heights, McCudden was one of the worst. So there's no oxygen either. Now, if you're a pilot, you're wearing an oxygen mask when you're flying around. You don't do that in World War One. McCudden's the worst for it because, as I was saying, the higher you are, the better chance you've got at the beginning. And also you can stay out of sight as well. If you're high enough, uh, they won't see you come in. So he would regularly fly sort of 17,000 feet and above and land with crippling headaches because there wasn't enough oxygen up there. Multitask or die as well. I know this is terrifying, terrifying to men because you're famously not very good at it. Um, but I just go back to this picture of me uh, messing about in an SC5. So you can see there that I've pulled the Lewis gun down to play with it. Uh, pulling that Lewis gun down was hard. I had to stand up to get enough weight behind it to drag it down. Uh, and I'm guessing at like five foot four and a bit, um, I'm not that much smaller than most of the pilots actually. I know Reese Davids was about five six. Uh, changing that Lewis drum is a two-handed job for me. No way I can pick, and it would be, the other drum would be down by my foot as well. So I would have to mess about in the cockpit to get that drum to fit it in. Um, all this time, I'd be flying at about 120 miles an hour, possibly with a German shooting at me and trying not to die, store my engine, get hit or do anything stupid like Albert Ball and fly into a cloud and come up upside down. Um, so there's that. Uh, also as well the fact that they would have goggles and things so that, and they would mist up so they wouldn't be able to see what they were doing so it's not comfortable it's not easy um and if you're and you read you read Volker's dicta about all the things you should concentrate on doing when you're flying to try and stay alive do you think you could concentrate on all of that whilst concentrating on all of that as well because I know I couldn't celebrity culture for that reason then People love pilots. 
Uh, we've all seen Lord Thrashheart, which doesn't really happen. You're not going to see any British pilots on this thing because it was quite rare for a British pilot to get famous. McCudden hated being recognised, hated people knowing his name. As far as the British were concerned, if you spent all of your time talking about uh, fighter pilots, then you weren't giving credit to the guys who were out taking the photographs and thing, and it wasn't fair, it wasn't cricket. So we didn't really do it, but other nations obsessed over their aces. Uh, the most famous one of all is the Red Baron. Uh, did you know that he really loved singing? And that actually he was kind of the daddy figure in his house after his dad lost his hearing and stuff. And he's actually a lot more sweet and sensitive than you think he would be. Uh, if you're thinking he was a crazy psychopath, that's more his brother Lothar, like in my interpretation of it. Uh, Manfred is actually quite sweet mannered and and lovely and he has 80 victories to his name uh, and masses of things named after him he's been buried three times just to get maximum publicity out of it uh, he was huge massively famous and um, even in terms of other countries you will know names or know of things connected to first world war flyers without even knowing it so at the bottom is roland garris who most of you did not identify <laughs> in the quiz uh, Yes, he is the French Open. All of the best tennis players in the world, even Novak Djokovic, if he gets his injection, uh, will go and play at Roland Garros for the French Open. So that whole complex is named after a World War I flyer. Uh, Baraka, above him, is Italy's number one ace, who's absolutely adored. He used to fly with a certain logo painted on the side of his plane, which you will recognise if you've ever seen a Ferrari, because that's where they got it from. So these guys are still in your consciousness even if you don't know it uh, unless they're British really which is sad in some way but I kind of applaud the reasoning why we didn't go into it I don't have much on air crews for you just because I've talked long enough already um, but hundreds of thousands of people serving so I mentioned some of the different roles so you can see the guy fiddling with the the landing plane thingies you can see the mechanic working uh, and the riggers as well. Someone would be responsible for all of those wires and keeping them taut and that. And then there's obviously the poor person that's responsible for making the wings stay on Arthur Reese Davids's plane. Huge amount of work went into keeping these men in the air. And usually they worked on the same plane or with the same pilot and they got to know each other and stuff. So it was, although it's officers versus men and that, it was just quite a neat little setup, I think, for the RFC. But never think that it's just about the pilots. Um, also as well, a huge role for women as well in aviation in the First World War, which again, we could do a whole, there is a history hack on it actually, where half the episode uh, is Lucinda talking about it and that's actually her speciality. So uh, if you wanna dig that out, I'll find out what episode number it was for you so you can have a listen because it's really interesting. But in terms of the women's RAF, um, it was disbanded in 1920 in the end. It sort of comes back with that title in 1949 and obviously women were doing air stuff all the way through World War II. Um, but by August 1918, they had 15,000 in it and they were broadly sort of broken down into four groups. So you had the clerks and the store women who did the administrative work, uh, the household. Um, so looking after people and then they were broken down to the technical and non-technical. Um, and that's before you even start to look at women working in factories like these two girls who are putting together a wing uh, and actually just. Oh, it does my head in, but the burnt records amongst the other stuff burnt was all the records of the women officers in the RAF, among which was Arthur Reese Davids's sister Vivian, and it drives me mad that I cannot find anything about it. So you did have women as well. So I hope now that you're not just rolling your eyes and regarding the air war as boring and something not that interesting to look at, because uh, otherwise I'm going to disown you. Um, quiz time, suckers. Right, detention people with your microphones on. Henry, are you there? Hello, Alex. Yeah. What was the name of the good old British workhorse aircraft? Oh, um, was that the BE2? Yes, the... it was. Oh, <laughs> you're off my shit list. Yeah. Thank goodness. <laughs> wow. That makes right. up for the store of one then. Yeah. <laughs> Giles, are you there? I'm here. Who inspired Ferrari's logo? The Italian guy. <laughs> <laughs> I will give you half a mark because I actually, I don't think I even said his first name. Yes, Francesco did. Baracca. Yeah, exactly. That guy. Uh, like, I, like I said, the Italian guy with a Ferrari logo. <laughs> Peter. 
Bull, where are you? He's run off. He's run oh, off. He, he just can't switch his camera on. Go how on many, then. Vi- how many victories did McCudden score? Do you know? Oh, there was lots of them. There was lots. I can't remember. 57. 57. Oh, I was going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it, just like uh, like like Hein Hein's ketchup, exactly. Yeah. Owen, what was the name of the French aeroplane that came in to end the Fokker scourge? Oh, uh, the Belair or something. Like that. <laughs> Go on, Bruce. Newport Scout. Thank That's you. The Newport Scout. <sighs> I just know Owen knows. Too late now. <laughs> but you gave me cake, so you're you're off my dirty list. Uh, Ali. Where did I say Regin- Reginald Chumley was buried? She done a runner. <laughs> Lockie? Hello? Do you remember where Reginald Chumley's buried? No. no. I do, I do, I do. Oh, go on. The Chalks Military Cemetery. I'm here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ali, you do this one. What year was Germany's air service founded? Uh, was it was it 13 or 12? No. <laughs> 1910. Right, oh, I, know 1910. I wrote it down, 1910. Beth, are you ready? Oh, oh, God. You ready? Okay. If you don't get this, I'm disowning you. Oh, he's the Russian. Uh... No, you can't fail this again, Beth. It's the same guy that you spent hours looking at in Belgium. Uh, uh, we saw lots of them. Uh. <laughs> it's Willie Coppins, who is Belgium's oh, that one. favorite ace. Um, just before I end, I will give you the names of some books because we are quite a lot of book slots in this room and I know you're all going to want an excuse to go and spend more money on books. <laughs> Just in terms of histories, um, I really like Josh Levine's On a Wing and a Prayer. Uh, it's got a different title in America. I think it's just called Aviators of the First World War or something because they didn't think you guys would understand the saying. I think it's a British yeah. saying. Uh, so that is a good overview of the air war. Um, Another good overview is this one by Peter Hart and Nigel Steele. Peter now doesn't agree with quite a lot of what he wrote in it, apparently. Um, And I pointed out to him yesterday that he wrote this when I was taking my 11 plus. Uh, But what he (laughs) did do, (laughs) I won't tell you what his response was. Uh, What he did do in the years after that was drive his publisher insane by producing a number of books about the air war until they banned him from doing any more about different stages, uh, particularly good are Bloody April and Ace is Falling. Actually, Ace is Falling was the first TV programme I was ever in. They made a documentary out of it. (laughs) uh, And that's about 1918 in the air war. And there's a lot in there about Manic and McCudden and sort of those guys that had evolved all the way through. Uh, the first world war in terms of i was there people um my absolute favorite is james mccudden because it details going right from being a mechanic on the retreat in 14 all the way to 1918 and for someone who was in the ranks and not that well educated i know he had help doing it but it's really well written as well um and he is my absolute favorite cecil lewis gets points for writing he won an oscar for writing pygmalion later on so he better be good at writing uh he's the one that's too tall uh, there's some really good stuff in there actually about the somme because he's there on the first of july flying over the battle of the somme with his knees under his chin uh who else did i put on here oh red baron is a famous one um the red fighter pilot or the red air fighter all of these have been reproduced so much that um, you can pick them up for peanuts. Like you really, these I was there ones, you can get for like a a pound, I think some of them. Um, So they really are worth getting hold of. Uh, I really like this one. This is what made me fall in love with Oswald Volker. This one isn't one of the cheap ones, uh, but it's really good. It's really heavily based on his letters and everything. And he is a sweetheart um, and I really do like him. That one was a good read, uh, as was Mother of Eagles, which is the war diary of the Red Baron's mother. Now, bear in mind that she has two boys die flying in the First World War, not only from an aviation thing, from a German home front perspective, the difference between the beginning and the end of, of the like, uh, conditions that she's living in as well. It's a really interesting book, but again, that's not one of the cheap ones. You, those two, you're probably gonna pay about 20 pound for. 
Uh, and then if you want a French one, this one will just utterly break your heart. Again, it's been, this is just one version of it. I'm sure it's this one by Henry Bordeaux. It leaned very heavily on the letters written by Gounamere uh, and knew his family. So it was written some sort of first-hand material not long after the war. And it will break your heart because he just should not be in the air by the time that he dies. Somebody should have pulled the plug and had him grounded before then. I think actually it says like that there were two officers on their way to ground him and he got off ground before they could get there and tell him he wasn't allowed to fly anymore but he's just in no fit state whatsoever um so that's it i'm done uh i hope you've enjoyed it i hope you've learned something 